morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. David said, a day in thy courts are better than a thousand. So no better place to be than in his courts on, in, on his day. Amen. We begin in Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, as we set the stage for today's message. Luke 18. One of Jesus' parables, I begin in verses 1 of Luke chapter 18. The Bible says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint. Saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded men. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And when he would not for a while, but after what he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard men, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he be along with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Our message for the hour is, faith it till you make it. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your courts on your day and to receive your message. I pray, Lord, that as I speak, Lord, that you may anoint my lips, Lord, that Jesus may be lifted up. That Christ, as he's lifted up all souls and sinners, may be drawn to him. May you grant me the courage and the conviction to preach a truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, is our prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Faith till you make it. When you look through Jesus' ministry on earth, you could see him healing, preaching, teaching, and doing a lot of things to uplift humanity, yes? But often in Jesus' messages, you would hear a cry. You would hear an appeal. You would hear him speaking to the hearts of those who heard him. And one of the themes we're going to talk about today is that of faith. And I want to go through a series of statements that Christ makes in the book of Matthew to underscore, to emphasize, to italicize his concerns regarding this very topic. Matthew chapter 6, and follow along with me as I read verses 30. Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Matthew 8, verse 26. Matthew 8, verse 26. And he said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith. Matthew 14, verse 31. Matthew 14, verses 31. Jesus says, And he immediately stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Matthew 16, verses 8. Matthew 16, verses 8. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. And finally, Matthew chapter 17 and verses 17. Matthew 17 and verses 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. There's a theme, there's a statement, there's a question that Jesus is repeating over and over. What is that? O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. And when he gets to Matthew 7, he says, O faithless and perverse generation. So when we hear Jesus repeating over and over and over again, O ye of little faith, O ye of little faith, we understand why he says what he says in Luke 18, verses 8. When the Son of Man comes, i.e. in this time, shall he find faith on the earth? Will Jesus find faith 
when he comes on this earth? Jesus is asking a question, and we will attempt today to answer it. Will he find faith when he comes? O ye of little faith. In order to understand this whole topic of faith, we need to define what faith is, right? There's a classical definition of faith. If you go to Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And that sounds very theological, right? If you were to explain that to someone, they'll walk away not really getting a good grasp of what faith is. What is faith? I think we could have Jesus explain it to us. So, the Bible is its own expositor. It explains itself. And in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verses 4, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Paul then takes that same message and echoes it in Hebrews 10, 38. Again, he says, the just shall live by what? By faith. So Paul, through Habakkuk, is saying the just shall live by faith. Yet Jesus, when he comes and he's tempted, he says, man shall not live by what? By bread alone, but by what? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, right? And he's echoing Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verses 3. So on one hand, you have Paul saying, the just shall live by faith, yes? On the other hand, you have Jesus saying, man shall not live by bread alone, yes? So either there are two ways to live, or these two things are one and the same. That is, to live by faith is to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? To live by faith is to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But don't take my definition of it. Let's let Jesus tell you. Matthew chapter 8, let's go back there. Matthew chapter 8, in the miracle of healing the Roman centurion, Matthew chapter 8, I'm reading from verses 8, sorry, verses 5 rather, to verses 10. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lied at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus says what? I will come and heal him, right? We expect Jesus to do that. When we, when we call, he answers. Amen? And verses 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but do what? But speak the what? But speak the word only. Now remember, we define faith as living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, yes? Yes? The the centurion says, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. You don't need to come, Lord. Your words will do the healing. (laughs) For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. (laughs) When Jesus heard it, he marveled. Now that should give, you should put an exclamation point there. There's not a lot of things that brings Jesus to the point of astonishment, of marveling. Not a lot of things that do that. But the Bible says that he marveled. Why? Why did Jesus marvel? And he said, verily I say unto you, I have found what? I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Where do you expect to find the most amount of faith? In the house of God, right? But Jesus could not find it in the house of God. He found it with a pagan soldier who believed the word of God that it would do what it says. Faith, as defined in scripture, is living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And to me, the next two verses are very troubling. It says in verses 11, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So from Jesus' perspective, the unbeliever exercises more faith in his word than those who should believe. That should cause you a little bit of unsettling. That should cause you some discomfort. Why is that? Why is that? 
Romans 10, 17 gives us the answer, right? Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by what? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we want to get little faith, what would Satan need to do? What would he need to attack? The hearing, right? Because that's the way to decrease our faith. But you may say, I hear the word of God. <laughs> well, it's not just necessarily the act of hearing is how you hear. Let's go to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 8. Luke 8. And we'll look at a parable that helps us unpack how we go from little faith to great faith. And we'll also finally answer that question that Jesus asked at the beginning. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith? On the earth. Luke chapter 8, this is the parable of the sower and the seeds. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 to 8, it says, And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake a parable, and a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked it. And finally, in verse 8, And other fell on good ground, and sprang up, and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Notice what Jesus is speaking about. He that hath ears to hear, let him do what? There's something about hearing and the word of God that Jesus finds important, that it actually relates to our faith. He gives the, the interpretation of this parable in verses 11 to 15, but I want you to pay attention to verses 18. Look at what verses 18 says after he explains the parable. Take heed, therefore, how what? How you hear. You see, friends, as we go to unpack this parable, Each of these seeds, they were hearing the word of God. But they did not all bring forth fruit. So whether you're listening online or you're here in this sanctuary, you may be hearing the word of God. That does not necessarily mean that you will bring forth fruit. So let's unpack how do we get to the point where we bring forth fruit. Is that something you want? Amen. Let's go back to verse 11. Verse 11. Now, the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. And verse 12 says, those by the wayside are they that hear, then comes the devil and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The first principle we want to talk about, those by the wayside, is preserve. It's what? Preserve. You see, it's one thing to receive the word, but did you preserve the word? It's one thing to hear the word, but did you preserve that which was given to you? I could ask you now, what was the sermon on last week? Many would struggle (laughs) to give an answer. What did you learn in your devotional life this morning? And you might be scratching your head like, man, I just, I know I studied, I know it was powerful, but what was it about? It's because we're not preserving the word. And the devil knows that, and that's why he's going to take away the word. So how do we preserve the word? Because I don't want to just beat you up today. I want to give you encouragement and to give you hope. Amen? So how do we receive, how do we preserve the word? There are three steps. We need to receive the word, we need to rehearse the word, and we certainly need to reflect on the word, right? Receive, rehearse, and to reflect. Let's talk about receive. In Acts 17, Paul is preaching to the church at Thessalonica. And eventually afterwards, he had to get out of there. They didn't want him there. And he got to the church of Berea. And in verse 11, he talks about the character of that church in that they they were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with a readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things that were so. They received the word. Now, in in today's culture, there's so many opinions, right? You turn on the news, you turn on podcasts, everybody want to tell you what they think. But we don't care about necessarily what he thinks. 
This is the authority. This is what guides us. It's not man shall not live by podcasts and news and whoever has their different philosophies out there. It's the word of God. And they receive that word with a readiness of mind. So the point I want to underscore here is many of us come to the word with our preconceived biases, yes? The word tells you, hey, you need to return one-tenth. It's like, I don't know about that, man. That doesn't sound, that doesn't make sense in my accounting. That's what the word says. The word says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. But Lord, it's slim pickings out here. That is what the word says. But if we trust the word, yes, if we receive the word with a readiness of mind that despite how we feel, we would trust God's word above our feelings, yes, put away the biases, receive the word. Now, it's not important just to receive the word. We need to rehearse the word. Colossians 3.16, you could write these down. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. And this is say, let the word of God dwell in you, but rich, your mind needs to be saturated with the divine detergent of God's word. Singing together with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So what are you saturating your minds with? You follow what I'm saying? If we want to preserve the word, we need to put it in. We need to saturate our minds with it, whether it's in song, whether it's in psalms, whether it's in reading, memorizing the scripture, whatever it is, we need to rehearse that word. And finally, we need to reflect. I would say there's a lot of times that we take in things that we don't spend time reflecting on. And that's the application. How does this apply to my life? David often, well, I shouldn't say he boasted, but if you look in Psalms 119, verses 97, I think, and 99, he says, I have more understanding than the teachers. I have more understanding than the ancients. I have more understanding, basically, than everybody else. And why, David, why would you make such a declaration? Because your words are my meditation. There is nothing stronger, or there's nothing more calculated to increase and to strengthen your mental faculties than the word of God. Not rocket science, not biochemistry, not history. It's the word of God. It helps to give us the understanding that we need for these times. Amen? So we talked about preserving the word. Let's talk about the next one in verses 12. Oh, sorry, verses 13. It says, they, are, they on the rock are they which when they hear, notice they also hear, <laughs> They receive the word with joy. Amen? Is it not a good thing to receive the word with joy? And these have no root. For a while they believe, and in time of temptation they fall. So in other words, these receive the word, they're happy about what they heard, but they lack the depth. They lack the what? And so when we talk about preserve for the first one, we want to talk about plow. We need to go deep. We need to do what? So when we talk about going deep, how do we go deep? I hear studying, okay. So let me ask you as a question, do any of you just honestly hear, do you ever get bored of reading God's word? Just be honest. Sometimes you read it and you're just not feeling it. Yes, I do too. So that, let's not try to fake it. Faith it until you make it, not fake it, right? <laughs> so there's some tools or some tips to help overcome that boredom, if you will, and that is asking questions. In other words, don't just get up in the morning, roll out of bed, open the book, and wherever the page falls, and that's what you read. That's not going to help you. We want to come to the Bible with questions in mind. With what? We want to come to the Bible with questions in mind. So it's an ask principle. Ask questions, search for answers, knock on t the doors until you receive it. So let's just say, for example... You are struggling with conflict with someone. And this someone is supposed to be godly, if you will. How do you deal with that? So you want to go to the Bible and look at all the verses or all the scriptures that pertain to dealing with your enemies. 
How did they gain victory with dealing with their enemies? How did they rise above their enemies? Psalms 23, right? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of who? Like, man, like, how do you get to that mindset? You got to search, right? So you're coming to the scriptures with a search in mind. Let's just say you were overlooked for promotion, but you have the skills. You have the talents and the qualifications. You didn't get it. You go to David. Okay, David, the Lord anointed you. You were called to be king, but yet you did not achieve that kingdom or receive the kingdom until you're 40 years old. How did you get the mindset to act like a king before you actually became a king? Do you follow that? We need to go to the scriptures with asking questions in mind. Let's look at one that I've done before, Genesis chapter 26. Give you a good example. Genesis chapter 26. Read a little quick verse here. It may seem very simple on the surface, but a lot of meat there to the eyes. I think actually I meant Genesis 25, sorry. Genesis 25. The Bible says that Isaac was 40 years old in verse 20 of Genesis, verses 20 of Genesis 25. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, Syrian of Pad, Padan Naram, the sister of Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Okay. So Rebekah has a problem. She has fertility issues, right? The Bible says she prayed. God answers, right? So the asking mind is like, well, okay, well, I pray for stuff and I don't answer like right away. So the question we need to ask is how long did Isaac pray before God answered? That's a question you want to ask because you need to say, well, okay, well, what do I need to model in my life that maybe I could receive the same answers that Isaac asked? Yes? Making sense? Are you guys with me? All right. I can't see with your mask, so. So it says she, um, she conceived in verse 21. Verse 22, and the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went and inquired to the Lord. I want to jump down to verse 26. It's a cut to the chase. And after that, his brother came out, which was um, Jacob, and took hold on Esau's heel, and his name also was called Jacob. And Isaac was how old? He was 60 years old when she did what? When she bore these children, right? Now in verses 20, how old was he when he started to pray? He was 40, yes, right? So how long was Isaac praying for before God blessed? So you see, friends, these men in the scriptures are men just like us, right? James 5 says, you know, Elijah was a man of like passions. There are things that we're praying for for the salvation of our children or family members for a very long time. And it may seem as if God is not hearing. But when we go to the scriptures and we ask and we seek and we knock, when we plow down below the surface, we receive encouragement and establish or receive the faith just like Isaac. Amen. So we talked about preserve, we talked about plow. Let's go back to Luke chapter 8 as we look at prioritize. Luke 8, Luke chapter 8. And verses 14. It says, And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to protect for perfection so the third principle is that of prioritize prioritize now it talks about things here is anything wrong with cares the cares of this life you guys don't seem convinced is anything wrong with cares of this life we need to pay bills yes We need to go to work, right? Anything wrong with pleasures? Certainly nothing is wrong with pleasures. But these things take preeminence in the life of the individual that they crowd out, that they choke out the word of God. And if we want to faith it till we make it, we need to prioritize the word of God above these things. That's why Job says in, I believe, Job 23, 12, I have esteemed the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. 
we need to prioritize. So when you rise in the morning, what do you reach for? You don't have to answer me, right? It's probably a device, right? And friends, that's why Jesus is asking the question. We reach for those devices like it's food. If we're really honest, we want to get the latest update, the latest feeds, we want to, and it's like, man, like, we got to prioritize. Listen to what Spurgeon says. There are times when solitude is better than society and silence is wiser than speech. We should be better Christians if we were more alone, waiting upon God and gathering through meditation in his word, spiritual strength for labor in his service. Why is it that some Christians, although they hear many sermons, make but slow advances in the divine life? It's a question we're asking today. Because they neglect their closets and do not thoroughly meditate on God's word. They love the wheat, but they do not grind it. They would have the corn, but they would not go forth into the fields to gather it. The fruit hangs upon the tree, but they will not pluck it. The water flows at their feet, but they will not stoop to drink it. From such folly, deliver us, O Lord. This does not need any overstating. We need to prioritize God's word. Put it as number one in our life. Carve out some time in your day that nothing can enter into where you can spend time sitting at his feet to hear his word. If that's clear, say amen. All right. Well, finally, we get to the good news. <laughs> um, in verses 15, it says of Luke 8, But they that are on good ground are they which, with an honest and good heart, having heard the word, they keep it, and they bring forth fruit with patience. This is to practice. Practice. So, there are a lot of science fiction Christians out here. And what do I mean by a science fiction Christian? It's like, just like you see something on, like a movie in science fiction, it's entertaining, it's fun, it all resides in the intellect. But you're not going to beam up out of space, you're not going to teleport to another universe, it's all in your head. But when we bring forth much fruit and moving from a science fiction Christian to an experiential Christian, we need to start practicing. And this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where now you take the word of God and you're bringing it into your everyday life. So here are some questions to ask. When you read the word, you have to ask, is there an example for me to follow? Is there a sin to avoid? Is there a promise to claim? Maybe your bank account is running low and you just have more month than money. And then you go to Psalms 37 and David said, I've been young, yet I've been old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. You may have the cares of the world upon you turmoil in your marriage, challenges with your children. And you go to 1 Peter 5, verse 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. There may be something that you want in your life, and you're not sure whether it is God's will. And so you go to Psalms 84, verse 11, the Lord our God is a sun and a shield. The Lord would give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. You may be starting a family, and you need divine help. And you go to Psalms 127, verse 1. Except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Lord, help me build this house. You see what I'm saying? You're taking the word of God, and you're bringing it into your daily life. It's no longer intellectual. You have anxiety. It's crippling. And you go to Philippians 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, right, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will establish your hearts in Christ Jesus. And you don't get up from your feet until he gives you that peace. It's bringing the word of God into your daily experience. 
other questions to ask. Is there a prayer to repeat? Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, right? Us shall humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways, yes? Then will he hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our land. Is there an error to mark? Is there a verse to memorize? For, I, I, I can't... <laughs> When you go in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, this blows my mind. Daniel's in captivity. He's lived, well, I don't say he's living the good life, but he's elevated to a high position. And Daniel goes into the book of Jeremiah in Daniel 9. And he says he understood by the books that, hey, we're supposed to be in captivity only for 70 years. And that time is fast approaching or already here, and we're still in captivity. The Bible says Daniel got on his knees and he began to pour out and pray according to the word of God. He memorized what occurred in or what Jeremiah had prophesied. It's like, Lord, you said it. God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent, Numbers 23, 19, and he was ready to claim it. And the Bible says that while he was yet speaking, the angel Gabriel was sent to fly swiftly. In other words, as the words were falling off the tongue of his mouth, because he prayed according to the word of God, heaven was duty-bound to answer that prayer. To fly swiftly, not at the speed of light, but at the speed of the word of God. Friend, that power is available to us. You wonder why we can't shake the foundations of the world? We focus on too many people's opinions and not God's word. And this is what we need to bring into practice. We want to change this community? It starts with this. Is there a command to obey? Is there a condition to meet? Is there a verse to memorize? Is there an error to mark? Is there a challenge to face? I want to end with this quote here. Try Subject Lessons, page 146. Because sometimes we walk around and we act like our, <laughs> our, sin is, our sin is bigger than our Savior. Hear this statement here, powerful. Never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. Amen? If you do, you will lose much. But looking at appearances and complaining when difficulties and pressures come, you give evidence of a sickly, enfeebled faith. Here's what we have to do. To talk and act as if your faith was invincible. To talk? That's why David looked at Goliath. He's like, you know what? <laughs> you come with me on a sword and a shield. I come to you in the name of the living God. I will feed you to those birds of the ear. Because he was coming on something that was substantial, the word of God. And we are the sons of David. So the good ground, if you want to bring forth fruit, if you want to have great faith, my friends, is to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I know this message may be challenging. So as we conclude, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 1 and 2. Paul is wrapping up his discourse in Hebrews 11 on faith. And he goes through all these various characters that we're familiar with. By faith, Enoch, by faith, Isaac, by faith, um, Abraham. Of all the things they did by faith. And Paul, as he gets to the end, <laughs> he says, in, he, as he concludes in Hebrews 12... Verses 1 and 2 says, Wherefore, seeing we have all these great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking to who? Jesus. Not the preacher. Not your godly parents. But looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You see, friends... <laughs> The faith is not just about us, right? But he which begun a good work in you is also faithful to complete it. That's Jesus' promise. But we need to practice. We need to do what? Practice. We began this message with a question. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? What do you think? Well, if I'm being honest and true to this message, it's not about what I think. What about what you think? In Revelation chapter 14, 
the three greatest warnings ever given to men are declared. And you get to the third angel's message, and it says, if any man worship his beast or the image or receive that number, we know all the penalties that would come with that. But John the Revelator, under the inspiration of the living God, he answers the question that Jesus asked. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Verse 12 of Revelation 14 says, here is the patience, right, of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Friends, you are the answer to Jesus' question in Luke 18, verse 8. John saw you embrace that challenge and continue to faith it till you make it. Is that your prayer? Is that your desire? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for these moments where we could learn about our faith, the faith that we don't have, and the faith that we need to have. Lord, we struggle with many things, but we know we can bring all our struggles to you. You've repeated over and over the lack of faith in your time and a lack of faith even in this time. But by faith, Lord, we want to practice. We certainly want to begin by plowing. We want to prioritize. We want to preserve. But we also want to practice that we may have the faith of Jesus. This is our prayer, Lord. Help it to be our experience. But we ask in his precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you.